So up to this point, it's been a relatively quiet offseason for the Cleveland Cavaliers, but I thought it would be fun to do a quick video just covering some of the storylines surrounding the team that someone might have missed if they're not paying close attention to everything going on in Cleveland since there really isn't that much going on. I know most people are patiently or not so patiently waiting for the Cavs to make a big swing or a splash in free agency, but the free agency pool is running very dry and I wouldn't hold your breath for anything major in that department. As for the trading market, I've said this a few times on the channel, but I'm not a cap expert, so don't expect me to break down the nuances or what the first and second apron means. All I know is that the Cavs have their hands tied in many ways, and making any moves is much more complicated than just firing up the trade machine and matching salaries. There are cap implications that this front office is trying desperately to avoid, and that is what has led to this long and drawn out process. As far as I understand, the crux of this dilemma is the Isaac Okoro situation, and that is our first topic for today. Now, I'm assuming everyone is familiar with Okoro, but just to quickly review, Okoro is a 23-year-old elite perimeter defender, if you ask me, he is firmly knocking on the door of being an all-defensive caliber player. We just saw him go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Paolo Bancaro and the two Jays in Boston. I think he did a fine job defensively in both of those series, and all around, he's just a great point-of-attack defender. Whatever you think of Okoro offensively, there is no denying his impact on the defensive side of the floor. Now, as for his offense, we all know the limitations. He's improved greatly as a shooter, but he's still at such a low volume and isn't drawing much attention out there. The confidence is shaky. His shot profile is extremely limited, so opponents just don't acknowledge Okoro as much of a threat. And over the last few years, he's become more and more reduced to being a stationary off-ball player. He's mostly standing in the corner. He doesn't seem to have much freedom dribbling the ball. And all of this has led to Okoro being a fairly one-dimensional player and a non-impact on the offensive side of the floor. So why am I saying all of this? Well, Okoro is a restricted free agent, and his contract will determine much of what the Cavs can do moving forward under the new CBA. There seems to be some credible reporting out there that the Cavs are exploring sign and trade options for Okoro with names such as Cam Johnson, Dorian Finney-Smith, and DeAndre Hunter as the most prominent players being mentioned. Right off the bat, I'll say Dorian Finney-Smith does not interest me. I would not be willing to give Okoro up for him. Yes, he is a little bit taller and he's a slightly better shooter, at least from a volume perspective, but he's just a worse player overall. And there's no sense in making the team worse because you want to add a traditional looking wing to the roster. It's just not a move that I'm interested in. As for DeAndre Hunter, I'm okay with him. I wouldn't hate that move, but Cam Johnson is the real prize in my opinion. He would instantly become the starting small forward on this squad and He's just straight up the best player who has been linked to the Cavs in these discussions, so I would be very happy with Cam Johnson in a Cavs uniform, but why is this all so complicated? Well, for starters, how valuable is Aguero? He's still young, he has an elite NBA skill in his defense, and he has improved in the department that is the most important, which is his three-point shooting. That is the swing factor, and whatever you want to say about him, he has clearly shown some tangible growth in that department. Now, maybe he hasn't grown enough to fully satisfy you, and I would agree with that, but I would still argue he is on a significantly better trajectory than some of the other 3 and D busts we have seen in the past, like Matisse Thibel or Josh Jackson. And so Okoro has tangible three-point shooting skills. No one should be considering him a complete failure up to this point, and I still think there's a clear path to him being a legit three-point shooter. I know I'm biased, but I don't think you have to squint that hard to see his improvements. So if you're the Cavs, are you comfortable selling low on this guy who might only be a few years away from being the exact type of two-way player you need on the wing and building on that? How much stock can we put into Okoro being their best perimeter defender and the most available player over the last two seasons? Is it possible that Okoro has been more important to this team's success than we have fully realized? I think his defense and availability would not be easy to replace. On top of this, some of his limitations might be blamed on the former coaching staff. The Cavs have ranked near the bottom of the NBA in pace over the last two seasons, and I think you can argue that if Kenny Atkinson truly revamps the offense and gets the squad out and running, then 
maybe a Coro feels like a more natural fit offensively. So if that ends up being the case, again, are you comfortable punting on a Coro as well as other assets to acquire Cam Johnson if a Coro might still have the potential to blossom into the 3 and D wing that you're looking for? With all that said, as much as I love a Coro, I would personally swing this trade for Johnson if it became available. That's the last factor to consider is that the Cavs are not operating in a vacuum. I don't really see the Cavs having the best available package here, but hey, who knows? Moving to our next topic and bringing you back to when the season ended and that report released that Darius Garland's agent, Rich Paul, would be meeting with the Cavs to discuss Garland's future if Donovan Mitchell were to sign an extension in Cleveland. Now, that was the original report that, as we know, was spun and twisted a million ways until the worst accounts on Twitter started churning out Darius Garland trade rumors. Uh, since then, Mitchell has extended, Rich Paul has met with the Cavaliers, and Darius Garland is still on the roster. Now, this makes complete sense to me. Uh, Rich Paul was just doing his job. It is his job to put pressure on teams and prioritize his client. Uh, his number one objective is making sure Darius Garland gets the bag. And so meeting with the Cavs to discuss a potential change of scenery and really just put pressure on them to make sure that Darius Garland is still being prioritized within the Cavs franchise is something that I would expect Rich Paul to do. Now, again, there was never a direct report saying Garland wanted to be traded or that he would demand a trade that was all speculated off of the original report. And I know some fans have said, well, if Darius Garland doesn't feel that way, then why doesn't he come out and say something? Well, now he did. Garland told Cleveland.com's Chris Fedor that he does not want to be traded, and that reflects the way Cleveland's front office has approached this offseason. Uh, personally, I don't see Garland being traded. In fact, I don't see any member of the core four being traded this summer unless a godfather deal is presented. And as much as I like the core four, all things considered, I don't really think anyone is making a godfather offer for Jared Allen or Darius Garland. And then there's just no way that I'm letting go of Mitchell or Evan Mobley regardless. So all of that combined with the cap limitations, this leads me to say the core four probably isn't going anywhere. Again, this could change. I'm just giving my view on the matter, but get ready to see the Cavs run it back. Uh, and to be clear, that's not exactly a bad thing. I know some people are frustrated to think that we're going to see the same core four out there once again, but this team won 51 games just a year ago, and they fell just short of that mark despite the wave of injuries they dealt with all season long. So that core four was one of the best lineups in the entire league their first season together. And while it was a little more murky their second time around, I still think there's a lot of raw untapped potential, and I think Kenny Atkinson will hopefully get the most out of it. And then the last thing I want to mention today that is still regarding the core four is the Evan Mobley extension. This is something that I would expect to get announced relatively soon, at least sometime during the summer. Mobley, in my opinion, has absolutely earned a max extension. He's a perennial Defensive Player of the Year candidate, and he clearly still has a high offensive ceiling, if you ask me. My only caveat slash concern here is that I hope the Cavs are positioning themselves to increase Mobley's usage. Because if you give Mobley a max extension, then you have to treat him like a max player. I know trading Jared Allen is an obvious way to clear the runway and let Mobley become whatever the best version of himself is, but there's still no excuse for Mobley to be as limited as he has been, even if Allen is sharing the floor with him. Mobley should be touching the ball more often, facing up rather than posting up, operating dribble handoffs, seeking his own shot, and attempting three-pointers at a much higher rate next season, regardless of whether or not he is playing center or power forward. This is an issue that can be solved without having to trade Jared Allen, so I'm excited for the Mobley extension. I think it'll be a huge win for the franchise, but they do need to adjust his role and start increasing Mobley's usage next season for this all to make sense. And that's all I have for today. I'll round this out by saying I am incredibly grateful for the support that this channel has been receiving since the season ended. It's been a ton of fun getting to make these short form videos and I hope you look forward to everything I have planned for the rest of the summer. I'll have videos recapping these upcoming summer league games as well as a podcast on Friday. So if you enjoy these quick recap videos, then please let me know because I would love to keep doing them. And if you want to help me out, then feel free to hit subscribe and drop a like. Uh, those two things make a big difference. Let me know in the comments what you think about any of the topics I just covered today. And with all that being said, go Cavs.